104. So you see how it's all working out? Perfect. <laughs> So we're going to get the uh, presentation well, on the screen. Yeah, we're, we're going to. We're, you got to give me a moment here. All right, I'd like to uh, welcome everybody to the Township of Georgian Bay Committee of the Whole for Tuesday, March 9th, twenty twenty one. We'll call this meeting to order at one o five. I'm going to ask uh, councillors if they have any declarations of pecuniary interest or code of conduct conflicts or anything like that. I'm seeing heads shake, so I um, presume we can go straight to our delegations. And we have with us today uh, Rupert Kindersley from the Georgian Bay Association and David Sweetnam from the G Georgian Bay Forever. And I believe they're going to talk about water levels on, in Georgian Bay, or rather, you know, Typical conversation over what? How many decades? As long as people have been on the bay, I think. Gentlemen, yes. over to you. Thank you. Okay, so th the purpose of having a deputation today is just to inform you of uh, what came out of our water levels symposium that we held last October. You can go to the next slide. Um, so here, here are the main topics that we addressed at that uh, symposium. Uh, we uh, wanted to find out what's known and not known about water level fluctuation cycles and if there really are any cycles. Uh, what's known and not known about water level control structures. Uh, these are the various different points in the Great Lakes system where there are man-made interferences in the natural flow. Um, then do we have all the data that we need to understand water levels and if not what data and data collection approaches should be prioritized. So basically to get up to speed on what is currently being done and what could be improved. Um, and also how, how can the uh, existing and to be collected data be converted to a consistent format and presented to better inform decision making. And this really addresses the hodgepodge of uh, different formats um, between the US and Canada on the data that is out there, um, which university um, academics and um, scientists can navigate around fairly easily, but is pretty useless for the general public. Um, so then we moved on in the afternoon to looking at what improvements could be made to coordination between the control boards that control those control structures and their coordination with other water levels control structures, not um, under the administration of control boards. Um, in order to better address extreme high and low water levels and looking for consensus on that. And really the aim here is, you know, that we do the best we possibly can to mitigate future extreme high and low water levels. And this is set against an ECC study, which we'll talk about later, um, which uh, has not been released yet, but we do have some information about. And then we, uh, wrapped up with the, the next steps um, uh, that we can all agree on based on what we learned. So um, David, take it away for the next slide. Are you on mute? You're on mute, David. David, you're on mute. <laughs> you're still on mute. I'm um, not sure what's happening. <laughs> oh, trying to find there we go. Finally. Trying, to, trying to see that little button with the light in my eyes was hard to uh, get to. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, sorry for that. So yes, the, the, we have two outputs from the symposium, uh, one of which the first is the Q&A document. Uh, we actually had um, 259 questions come in from the public. Uh, during and then following the actual symposium. And we undertook to answer all of those questions, uh, including getting information from the actual identified experts. And uh, some questions we would ask two or three experts to comment on and then summarize their responses. Um, it's a 45 page document. So it is quite a daunting standalone reference, but it is very seminal. It uh, answers every question that people had uh, about the water levels issues and uh, the relating 
factors and, uh, and go forward um, types of uh, problems that may be presented in the future. So we, we are calling this a seminal reference in that it's very encompassing and it has the input from all of the recognized experts in the field. We will be preparing uh, communications products that basically go after components of this so that we can put information into a digestible format and share it with the, the community, but also uh, have this document in the background as the full expert commentary. Um, the second output from the uh, forum itself is an actual synopsis document or a minutes, if you will, of the actual symposium event. And both of these documents are published on the GBA website as well as the GBF website. And both are available for public consumption uh, right now. Over to you, Rupert. Now oh, I'm muted, there we go. <laughs> Um, why don't we uh, click again there, David, we can bring up the rest of it. So um, there were certain key takeaways that we, uh, we, we got from this symposium, um, some of which was to dispel some misleading information that is floating out there. Um, one of the, the first one was that the current management of the Great Lakes system, and this is by the control boards, is not deficient, including plan 2012, which is the plan that uh, governs what is done um, of the flow from Lake Superior into Michigan Huron at St. Mary's. It was very clear from the presentation that plan 2012 is being operated correctly um, and, and there's really no issues there. Um, and the conclusion, uh, the corollary to that is that the solution to extreme water levels is, does not lie with improved management of the current system. There really are no significant issues uh, with the way these the government bodies are managing the current system. The other thing that is very important uh, that we wanted people to realize is the, is the role of the IJC. The IJC is an ad ad advisory body which provides recommendations to the federal governments in the US and Canada, it has no power in itself to implement any action. Um, uh, other things that came out of this whole discussion were that, um, uh, and in fact, we looked into this after this symposium because we weren't able to engage OPG beforehand, um, but there's been a lot of discussion out there that the um, control dams at Long Lac and Ogoki on the northern uh, shore of, of the northern shore of Lake Superior should be adjusted to, um, to help uh, reduce Lake Superior water levels. Well, the, the reality is this can't be done. Uh, in 2002, two new water management plans were put in place for this very large basin. Uh, neither of them uh, have any um, provisions to deal with uh, Lake Superior water levels. Um, these plans have worked very well. There are six First Nation bands involved, including uh, in addition to OPG, MNRF, and MECP. They have improved the uh, standard of living for those First Nation bands. They've reduced flooding. They've increased fish stocks. They've boosted the commercial fishing industry, uh, which is why the standard of living has gone up, uh, because that commercial fishing industry is run by the First Nation. And uh, biodiversity, habitat, all those things have, have been improving. Um, to make any adjustment at Long Lac or Goki now uh, would require a lengthy negotiation. The likelihood is that if anything was changed, it would be minor. Minor is not going to do anything. So I think we need to forget about any option up there that will help with mitigating our high or low water levels. Um, we are looking at the, at the adjustments at the Chicago diversion and more on that later. Um, that's the uh, diversion at, at Chicago out of Michigan Huron. These are all, both of these uh, long lag, Agoki uh, diverted the water back in 1945. Uh, the, the Chicago diversion was before that. So these are long time diversions out of the system. Um, and uh, really the conclusion was that the tools that we currently have in our toolbox for mitigation of, of Great Lakes water levels are very limited. And if we're gonna do anything meaningful, we need to make major investments. So I think um, over to you now, 
Back to you, David. Thanks, Rupert. One of the uh, one common question that, that recurred many times was uh, why is the historic range of water level fluctuations on Michigan Huron so much higher than the range that's experienced on Lake Superior? And so if I can just schematically point out uh, this diagram here that the circle represents Lake Superior and the square around it is just a graphic representation of the size relative to the lake of the watershed. So Lake Superior is actually almost 40% of its watershed, meaning that 40% of the water that falls in that area falls directly on the lake surface. The other 60% falls on the land and then runs into Lake Superior. Michigan Huron, on the other hand, is much smaller in relation to its uh, watershed, representing only about 32% of the watershed. So uh, less water falls directly on the lake and more falls onto the land surrounding the lake, running into the lake slower over time and therefore providing increased variability. The, the other thing is that the Lake Michigan Huron watershed is almost double the size of the Lake Superior watershed. So this extra water landing on the land and then running into the bay means if there's precipitation anywhere in that large uh, watershed, we will eventually see that water make its way into Michigan Huron. And that of course provides more variability in the actual system itself. And finally, uh, Lake Superior has no inflowing major tributary, uh, unlike the St. Mary's River flowing into Michigan Huron. So any additional Lake Superior variability ultimately ends up being transferred into Lake Michigan Huron with a time lag. But Michigan Huron therefore experiences much more a dynamic range of water level fluctuations. And if we look at that from kind of a graphic perspective, the watershed area here of Michigan Huron compared to Lake Superior, you can see the size difference, but also notice at the bottom that the range of fluctuation historically in Lake Superior is about 1.19 meters or 3.9 feet. Whereas the historic water level fluctuation of Michigan Huron is 1.93 meters and about 6.33 feet. And, and the, it's the, the physical structure of the lake and the watershed that largely drive that. And one of the other things that we keep hearing misstated out in the public is that Michigan Huron has the widest range of water level fluctuations. And of course that, that's not true. The historic water level fluctuation of Lake Erie and Lake Ontario both are higher than the water level fluctuation experienced in Michigan Huron. And you can also see that this accumulates going downstream with the, the furthest downstream lake, Lake Ontario, having the highest variability. And of course that's because of the sum total of the variabilities upstream that end up being transferred down into that watershed. Over to you, Rupert. Uh, this is a schematic uh, showing how Plan 2012 has actually been operated since uh, January 2015. And, and what it shows is that since uh, around March 2018, um, the way the balancing factor between the two uh, lakes, Lake Superior and Lake Michigan Huron, they have actually favored Lake Michigan Huron in terms of reducing the flow um, from Lake Superior into Michigan Huron to the detriment of Lake Superior, if you like. Um, so increasing the water level in Lake Superior and decreasing it on Michigan Huron, contrary to what is being uh, stated in, in, in certain, uh, you know, certain information that is out there in the public. Uh, this is very important uh, uh, because, we, you know, we need to work together uh, with our uh, with our government agencies on this. And um, it's not helpful to tell them that they're not doing their job properly when it's not the case. So we, we drilled down into this. We asked for a presentation from a senior uh, representative who could uh, provide us with the real data on Plan 2012. Let's go on to the next page. And uh, I just wanted to put up on the screen all the different um, control structures, which I referred to earlier. So you can see at the top here, you've got the long lack and Nagoki diversions that we spoke about. And then you've got the, uh, the relative flow rate in uh, meters per second here. 
uh, meters cubed per second, I should say. Um, then you can see the, uh, the average uh, flow through uh, St. Mary's, um, the Chicago diversion that we also mentioned, the flow through St. Uh, Clair River, which is considerably higher than the flow through St. Mary's, um, and the Welland Canal, which actually bypasses Niagara Falls, is uh, somewhat relevant. Um, there are some minor works on uh, Niagara River, which really don't change the flow at all, but there's the flow through Niagara River. And then at the very bottom end of the system, uh, through the Moses Saunders Dam. And you can see how these four flow rates uh, uh, through the connecting channels increase as you go through the system, not too surprisingly. So some of the other uh, takeaways from the symposium really are that residents, businesses, the ports uh, that make their business homes on the, uh, the Great Lakes, marinas and municipalities need to have the best information available in order to make investment decisions. And one of the things that really uh, stood out to us through this uh, process of researching and then undertaking the actual symposium is there is a, a key bit of research that's currently still inside of Environment and Climate Change Canada that's a new model that's actually applying some new techniques to actually try to model the impacts over the next 80 years of climate change on water levels in the Great Lakes. And when this data was initially presented, which is about a year and a bit ago that Rupert and I first saw it, it actually uh, presented a fairly alarming view of what might possibly be coming down uh, the line here. Now, obviously with modeling, when you're looking into the future, there's variability and uncertainty. And scientists are often more comfortable with those terms than the public is. To the public, it means maybe the scientists don't know what they're talking about, but any, science where, any scientist worth their salt will always indicate the, the uncertainty in a model. And it's not, uh, it's not always intelligent to uh, discount that, um, that model just because there's some uncertainty there. Um, in public, there's also some conversations about a conflict between the methodologies that are being used, the components method and the residuals method. But in fact, these two methodologies are used for completely different purposes and they are not in conflict with one another. Uh, and in fact, the Large Lake Statistical Wallet Water Balance Model, with this, which this new Environment Canada study is employing, is working to reconcile discrepancies between these two methodologies. So that was an important uh, takeaway for us to try to figure out how we could encourage this report to become officially released. Um, and then action on specific improvements to the quality and content of water levels data and modeling. Rupert referred to that uh, when he was outlining the objectives of the symposium uh, in the first slide this morning or this afternoon. And we actually did determine that while there is a lot of data that's available and the scientists have access to it and can tease out the information that they want, it doesn't always make its way in a, in a clear and communicated uh, way to the public. And so there is opportunity to improve this uh, water levels data and modeling and the outputs thereon. So when I say alarming, um, the, the 80 year outlook potentially from this model indicates that water levels could be uh, above and in some case, uh, well above the high water level extremes that we experienced through the beginning of 2020, all the way through to the summertime, uh, late summer of 2020. Water levels could actually exceed that, uh, that water level uh, going forward. And without understanding that, it really becomes impossible for municipal governments to make these investment-based uh, decisions. Uh, and finally, the, there was a proposal put forward by the Great Lakes Adaptive Management Committee back in 2012 as a result of the Upper Great Lakes study that the International Joint Commission completed. And they uh, proposed to create a Great Lakes Water Levels Advisory Body. And it was felt that, the, uh, that that should actually be re revisited, that the formation of that particular uh, a body should actually be taken up again because it would provide opportunities to distill this information out, improve sharing across uh, multiple control boards throughout the system, as well as uh, making this information more available to the public and, uh, and our municipal gov governments and provincial uh, government bodies. 
Um, one other thing that we kept hearing was uh, that wetlands were, were adversely affected by historic water level fluctuations of 6.33 feet. Um, in fact, our great Georgian Bay wetlands are amongst the healthiest wetlands on the planet. And they evolved in the spaces where they exist and where this historic water level regime of 6.33 feet existed. There are su suggestions out there that uh, wetlands are adversely impacted if wetland or if water level fluctuations go beyond five, five and a half feet. And in fact, that's simply not the case. Uh, wetlands are not pushed up against granite shorelines. If the water gets you know, a little bit deeper, the wetlands are still there and they still flourish. Um, NASA study that Georgian Bay Forever did showed that the wetlands are very resilient, both at extreme highs and extreme low levels, but that there is a, a geographic transition from one end of uh, Georgian Bay, the southern end of Georgian Bay to the northern end of Georgian Bay, depending on where the water level uh, is. And also because of development pressures in the southern portion of Georgian Bay, as water levels declined to the record lows, uh, we did see a depletion of coastal wetlands in the southern portions of uh, Georgian Bay. Now the, the title page that I'm showing here is a study that's currently underway by Environment and Climate Change Canada to come out with a definitive study on the environmental resilience of our coastal wetlands. And that uh, report will be coming out later this year and we'll have a lot of uh, current information and really be able to answer this question directly. Over to you, Rupert. Okay, so finally, um, we wanted to draw atten your attention to a few things which we think you should consider around uh, water levels, uh, particularly in the context of the ECC uh, report that we, uh, David was referring to. Um, so when we got information back in July, 2019, there was a potential in there for a gradual change over the next 80 years, and they said nothing happening straight away, but that gradual change could yield uh, water levels uh, within 80 years of three feet higher than the last um, uh, round of uh, high water levels we had in 2019 and 20. Uh, this, that, that's an, that's <laughs> a very significant impact. Um, we believe that because this is what the report is predicting, this is why it's taking so long for ECC to release it. Um, and what we're talking about here is um, more, a, a, a shorter gap between extreme highs and extreme lows and a gradual increase in those extremes at both ends. But the extreme lows are really not gonna be changing that much, only about four inches lower than the last time we had uh, extreme lows. Um, on top of that, we've got increased uh, wind speeds as a result of uh, climate change. So there's gonna be more wave action, run up, fluvial and fluvial flooding uh, need to be considered. Um, of course, one of the, the biggest things for municipalities is uh, what to do about the uh, high water level mark in, in planning regulations. Um, this is really something that I'm sure you're already looking at. Um, but uh, you, you perhaps might want to wait until this report comes out and then have a really serious think about it. Um, and I've, I've put a detail here as to what you have at the moment. I think that's correct, but if it's wrong, then uh, apologies. Um, and uh, so as David was saying, all of this impacts what investment decisions uh, you make as a municipality in docks, coastal roads and infrastructure, boat launches, et cetera. Um, you need to know what's coming down the pipe so that you don't invest in something that then becomes redundant a few, in a few years time. Um, and this is obviously, obviously extremely important for our businesses on the shore, particularly marinas, um, ports, and, and in addition to our, our residents and our, our um, taxpayers. <laughs> in, in, your, in, in uh, TGB. So um, really, uh, and, and in particular, uh, some, a lot of thought needs to go into the siting of septic systems uh, in this context and um, what um, remediation action can be taken to address problems with high water levels from that um, docks, boat houses and low elevation shoreline structures are obvious somewhat easier to deal with. You can raise them in most cases. 
Um, but these are some of the things. We just wanted to provide a list of what we thought are matters that uh, the township should think about in the context of what we are facing over the next 80 years in water level fluctuations. And I think that's it. Is it? Yes, that concludes. Our so, only we wanted to open it up to questions at this point. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, it's greatly appreciated. And uh, perhaps we can, uh, Mr. Sweeten, are you the one with the, the screen sharing? I'll, I'll turn it off now. Because then we, then we can see everybody's faces a little larger. Yes. Which is always a little easier. There we go. All right, much nicer. So council, um, I see Councillor Douglas's hand and I'm sure she'll be followed by others. Okay, then I see Cooper, then I see Jarvis. So we're gonna start Douglas, Co Cooper, Jarvis. You're, you're muted, Cynthia. Sorry, uh, David and, and Rupert, thank you so very much for your presentation. I mean, the information is invaluable uh, to all of us and uh, certainly way out of the scope of uh, most of our knowledge and how to even obtain this. So the services you provide us as a township is amazing and uh, helps certainly bring some things into perspective that it's just a little overwhelming when you don't know all the facts. So thank you for that presentation today. Uh, it's greatly appreciated. Our pleasure, thank you. Councillor Cooper. Well, thank you, gentlemen. And um, I just wanted to ask one quite simple question. In summary, you've said we're kind of, what's the right word? I won't say the right word, but <laughs> we're going to have a real challenge. And you are really saying that man has virtually no control over water levels in the middle Great Lakes. Um, or there, there may be things that we can control, but we don't have the ability to control because of certain government uh, bodies. Wh wh which is it? Um, well, let, let me just back up. I mean, uh, we do have a long list of action items that came out of this um, symposium uh, on, on, a, on a broad range of topics as to, as to what we can do, first of all, to do the best job possible to mitigate extreme highs and lows with the tools that we have and, uh, and a, a number of um, action items on data to so that people can get a better understanding of what is happening. However, you're right. I mean, to make any real significant um, difference as we go forward, we're gonna have to think very seriously about very major investments. And when you compare the cost of those investments against the expense, the annual expense, um, going forward of dealing with these extreme low and high water levels, I think there's a good economic argument for doing that as well. Um, particularly in the US, there's, you know, there's a lot more shoreline activity than there is on the Canadian coast. Uh, and don't forget, this is very much a joint US and Canadian matter to deal with. So that is something that we will be following up on. So it's not a question of, no, there's nothing we can do. Um, we're, rot, we're very limited with the tools that we have at the moment. Uh, there's nothing particularly wrong with what's happening at the control structures. The job they're doing is pretty good. Um, there may be some minor improvements there, but nothing that's very significant. If I may just follow up with it briefly. Um, so there may be some things we can do. Uh, it strikes me, I think what you also said, and I could be wrong, but the, um, the uh, especially the shoreline in the middle Great Lakes in the U.S., are fairly low slope and not sort of, uh, a lot of places are gonna be flooded if we get even higher waters. And, and so I would think that the US would be pretty motivated, would they not to do something about this? Uh, yes, and, and the good news is that the, um, the, the current administration in the US actually believes that climate change is real. So they are much more with the program than the previous administration. <laughs> so we are expecting a lot more um, positive uh, moves by the U.S. in this direction. And, and, and hopefully we can capitalize on that. And if I could add just one minor point is that uh, the Earth's crust is actually, you know, moving. And it's declining down around the Chicago area, which means high water levels will become even more of a concern for them as they subduct. 
uh, where in the northern portions of Georgian Bay, the land level is actually rising. And there is currently a work in process to revise the Great Lakes datum uh, with new information, given that the Earth's crust has sh shifted so much since 1985 that all of the navigational and uh, topological mapping needs to be updated. So that work is in process right now. We barely touched on that in our symposium because that would be a whole other uh, you know, group of scientists that would need to address that work, but it is underway right now. You've been talking to Nick Isles. Yes. <laughs> All right, thank you. I got Councillor Jarvis followed by Councillor Rienko. So I, I, I gather what you just noted was a uh, isostatic rebound and the opposite of isostatic rebound, whatever that term is. I'm, I'm grateful that I now understand certain scientific technology I didn't, uh, today being pluvial versus fluvial. Um, I, am, I am curious, there have been an number of very strident voices over the years, um, not necessarily condemning, but definitely being very loud about certain diversions or additions to the Great Lakes system uh, being well within government control and to the point of almost there being a conspiracy that nothing's being done about these things. Uh, I, I note the Ogoki diversion um, the concept at St. Clair of uh, what's the word for all the sediment being moved out and then moved back in uh, and then control structures in there. Have we been able to sort of calm some of these voices down with this, with this information or do we think we can? You want to take that one, David, or do you want me to? I'll let you do that, Rupert. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're right. There, have been, there has been a lot of um, noise out there. Um, unfortunately, a, a great deal of it is misinformation. And what we were trying to do in this symposium and our deliverables after is, is actually just put out there the correct information. Um, you know, we don't want to get into uh, uh, big debates on, on, on uh, minor parts of, uh, of, of, of the issues um, or even major parts. We're just putting out the correct information. We're very careful about the information we put out. Um, you know, we're only using peer-reviewed uh, scientific uh, research and studies. Um, we we don't jump to conclusions. We talk to people, find out what's really going on. That's how we got to the bottom of Long Lack Ogoki, and, and we're able to put forward that information. So that that's what we're doing. Um, we hope that that will lead to a better understanding of what really is happening <laughs> and what, what the, the action items we can take and the action items that we can't take or at least won't have any real impact. So um, there, there is, as I mentioned earlier, there's a, a lot to, that we can do and we've got a long list of action items which you can see on our websites, um, number one. And number two, we are following this uh, symposium up with a discussion about um, what the actual impacts are and how we can address those, um, adapt to them, whatever. Uh, we had a large number of questions on that particular topic, which we did not answer for the reason that we weren't dealing with that at the last symposium. So uh, a lot of uh, stuff that's out there is talking about impacts and adaption. So we need to address that. Uh, well, I certainly hope that's session. how things work out because having stuff come in that's other information is can be rather distracting. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Rianco. Uh, thank you. And uh, thank you, Ruben and Dave. It was a great presentation. I'm glad that somebody is studying this issue in great detail. Um, one of the recommendations you're making here, I guess right now for planning purposes, our high water mark is at 177.4. And you're suggesting that we increase that by a, a one full meter up to 178.4. Um, so through all these studies, and I guess continuing doing studies, you are absolutely co convinced that the water level is going to go up and never down on, on general. And that you're suggesting that we change our uh, planning uh, high water mark uh, uh, one meter up. Is well, that... 
Well, I think what I was saying is that it might be best to wait until this ECC study is actually released and you can examine it and analyze it. Um, I'm not suggesting any precipitate action, but I'm just giving you a heads up that I, I expect that the conclusion that you will reach is the same one that we've reached from our look at the preliminary release of details, um, that the high water mark issue is going to be a fairly major one for all coastal municipalities because of what's coming down the pipe. Um, but uh, I realize that it is uh, highly impactful in your planning regulations um, in, 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 a, in a large number of areas. So uh, definitely nothing precipitate, but it's just a heads up that you're going to need to look at this, I think, down the road. Yeah, thank you. And when's, when's that uh, plan for? What, what's the date of that report coming out? <laughs> so, Paul, that, that's some, or sorry, Councillor Wienko, that's uh, uh, something that actually you think it would be helpful at the, the correct point, and Rupert and I are working towards this, to, to have some support from municipal governments for us to go to Environment Canada and actually get this report released. Uh, before we have the scientific uh, analysis in front of us, all Rupert and I can talk about is preliminary uh, data that was presented in public a number of times, but with the timestamp that it was preliminary data only. So we, would, uh, we are planning to make a, a more strenuous approach to Environment Canada to release this study, which I should say its first public debut was over a year and a half ago. And it's been stuck in a technical internal review at Environment Canada uh, for way too long right now. And we suspect, as Rupert mentioned, that it's because of the magnitude of this impact that it would be very alarming for people to see and therefore Environment Canada want to be very careful about uh, how it's communicated. But getting this study released is a key uh, piece of information that's required for any of these decision-making processes. But, but I would stress that uh, as with any uh, predictions of water levels, there is a great deal of uncertainty. So, however, because it's amalgam of uh, a large number of um, highly qualified researchers uh, work. Um, it is not something that we should be ignoring. Um, okay, I, I see Councillor Douglas's hand. Um, Ms. Douglas. Thank you. Um, I, um, I just had a question about you were saying it would be very helpful for the townships to provide some support to get this document released in in what way would that take form uh, uh, should i take that one down yes please yeah so so we're we're intending to put a joint letter of uh, gba and gbf into eccc with copied to whoever we think we should copy it to uh, but would include all the townships um so you can see what we've written to them and you know if you feel it's appropriate uh, uh, your endorsement or your support for what we're asking for, I think would help to get this report released. Um, actually, it should really go out to the uh, um, Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Cities Initiative uh, because it affects all municipalities on all the Great Lakes. Um, um, so we would hope to get their support too, for instance, and BOCA and, and other organizations. I mean, we need to, our, our lone voice saying, please release the report is probably not going to do it. We need to have more people asking for the same thing. And, and really, it's inappropriate to uh, have this information floating around and not released because it is extremely important, I think, for, for anyone making investment decisions that might relate to uh, water level fluctuations. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your answer. Understood. Councillor Cooper, we, we, we're doing a second round now and we've missed a couple of councillors, namely uh, Hazelton and Bocek. So if they ever stick their hands up, they will get priority. But in the meantime, Councillor Cooper. Yeah, I'll, I'll just be brief. I just wanted to understand um, in terms of wh wh what we're trying to do at the township is in terms of dealing with this is be uh, somewhat proactive about high and low water levels. And, and I think what you said was that we'll still continue to have, the probability is that we'll continue to have both high and low water levels. It's just there's a, a higher probability that we may see some higher ones, 
but it doesn't mean we won't see low ones. Uh, we'll see, we've seen that same history over 100 and whatever it is now, we've been measuring in 120 or 30 years. So the low water levels will be there. And I think you said that in, as part of your presentation, did you not? Yes. Thank you. Um, and, and, and incidentally, just looking at the short term, we're, we're going to have uh, lower water levels, uh, almost certainly going to have lower water levels this year than we had last year. And we may be uh, entering an, an era where water levels are somewhere mid-range for a bit. Um, we don't know, nobody knows, but um, which is why I said, you know, there's no need to take precipitate action on this. Uh, it, it needs very, very careful thought. And we need that study out. All right, I'm not seeing more hands raised. Um, I'm gonna say thank you very much. I found this very enlightening. Um, my one question that, and it's partially been uh, raised so far, but one of the things we've been hearing for years when, when we have exceptionally low water levels and now exceptionally high is the, the St. Clair River area, the, the connection, if you will, between Lake Huron and Lake Erie uh, that something man-made should be put in there to help control water flow. Um, what is your opinion, gentlemen, on whether the, the major investment is required there, or do we just let, we might as well just let nature take its course? Uh, do you want to change that? Uh, take that one, David? Sure. So, um, Mayor Kutzer, we came out with a study uh, a, a number of years back simply asking the question if structures could provide any type of uh, resilience in the face of climate change. And the, the engineering study came back and said, yes, it's possible, but there are obviously costs associated with that. Currently, there are no structures whatsoever mm -hmm. in the below the St. Mary's River. All the way over Niagara Falls is uh, uncontrolled. Um, but it might turn out that, uh, that there's no political appetite for any of that type of structural intervention in the river. And therefore, it would be impossible to expect uh, somebody to fly in and fix the problem, right? It may be that it, it does reside at the municipal level and with individual property owners, uh, port authorities, and so on, to figure out how they can implement adaptive measures that will actually uh, you know, incorporate this wider range of water level fluctuations. To uh, Councillor Cooper's, just to extend my answer of mm -hmm. yes there, um, these water level fluctuations are becoming more rapid. You're seeing a much shorter period of time over which the water level changes. And the magnitude of change on a year over year basis is at kind of an all time record level. So we're seeing the most precipitation ever in the basin over the last three years. Uh, you know, that, that kind of increased inflow of water level is going to make a flashier system. And so do we adapt individually? Do marinas all adapt individually? Or is there an opportunity to actually have an official study done to find out if kind of a common structural intervention in one of the connecting channels might actually be able to improve the situation. And that, that shouldn't just be limited to a, dis a dissection of the St. Clair River. It may be that the 120 year old structures up in the St. Mary's River need to be looked at again and so on, right? But, but it, uh, right now we don't see the political will necessarily for that action. And therefore sitting here, even if there was today, we would be talking about a 20 year process. So we can't just ignore this issue. And we felt that it's important to just bring the information to everybody uh, instead of trying to make a recommendation at this time, one way or the other. So in other words, individuals residing on Georgian Bay should invest in a floating dock instead of investing in political action. I, I think that's- In this regard. Be, yeah, that's going to be wise. <laughs> without, <laughs> uh, without expanded unencapsulated polystyrene. <laughs> well, well, yeah, well, we've, we've already uh, uh, expressed our opinion that, that everything has to be encapsulated, not to worry. Great. Um, we've already taken that. Um, yes, there are other ways that you can achieve your flotation that's far safer. It's, it, it, it's a very interesting thing. I find personally, having been involved now more with uh, uh, the District of Muskoka governance, how many of our people in inland lakes can get very concerned about a half foot uh, variance in the spring. Um, and, uh, you know, we try to explain that we can have that in an hour. 
Um, so it, it's, it's a different world. And, and if you want to be in Georgian Bay, um, you have to accept the fact that water is going to go up and down as it has for centuries and long before any of us were around. Um, and it will continue. But as you say, in, in, we've gone from record lows to record highs in seven years. I don't think we've ever accomplished that or we're, we're not aware of that ever happening before. And so um, I'm going to say, well, thank you very much, gentlemen, for this presentation. I think it's very informative. I think that I, I like your suggestions that we can take this into account when we look at any investments or our future planning um, rules and guidelines. I think that's extremely important and uh, greatly appreciate the fact that we know that both of you are um, available if we uh, have more questions. And then um, and we greatly, I think we're all appreciative of all that you do for the, for the Bay and, and um, thank you. Well, thank you all for your support. Yeah, thank you. Um, just, uh, I put in the chat box, uh, the link to the Georgian Bay, um, um, yes. Georgian Bay Association information on the symposium, which also includes a summary, which might be a little bit more easy, more digestible than our 45 page and 44 page <laughs> documents. Um, Thank you very much. Basically mirrors the update article that I wrote uh, recently. And David, you might want to do the same for your provide a GBF link for this group. There's, there's some additional and different information on the GBF website. And, 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 and yeah. everyone. Yeah. Please, please include us in any of this correspondence you have with uh, the ECCC in regard to getting the report out because, you know, our council may have an interest in uh, endorsing that uh, request. That would be really helpful. Thanks so much. Great to see thank you. Everybody. Much. Bye, right, thank you. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. I know. Well, Council, I know we're almost at an hour into our Committee of the Whole meeting, um, but now we, what's in front of us is actually adopting the agenda. I have moved by Councillor Rianco, seconded by Councillor Jarvis, be it resolved that the Committee of the Whole does hereby adopt the March 9, 2021 agenda as circulated. All those in favor. All right, and that is carried. Thank, I say thank goodness that we've been in this for uh, an hour now. Um, Madam Clerk, open forum. I haven't been made aware of anybody registering to take advantage of the open forum opportunity. I have not received any requests for that. So. Okay, then I'll we'll move on. And the next item we have in front of us is um, an open discussion with regards to the Waste Management Committee. And Ms. Gunby, you are in front of us, so that means yeah. you want to speak. That does. Um, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to uh, just remind uh, committee members that um, staff did not prepare a report for this conversation as at the last meeting you had agreed to sort of absorb the waste uh, yeah, the waste committee into committee the whole so that the conversation could be just between committee members and not members of the public um, as you are the ones who are more involved in the district happenings i guess and all of their uh, not all of their meetings about the waste so staff have nothing to present to you today but um councillor ryanko did ask that this be added to the agenda for sort of a broad discussion between committee members on the matter of waste at the district thank you so council i think the the question is where do you want to go from here with regards to uh the waste situation we we, we know uh, that the um that the district is working on this file and uh, we know that there are some concerns. So I will start with Councillor Hazelton followed by Councillor Cooper. Thank you, Mayor Coots here. I wanted to uh, just bring forward a couple of action items that were delegated to staff, which we haven't had a response back from that will have a, a key impact in what we discuss and how we discuss it. Um, the first uh, I will bring up as um, uh, Council uh, Resolution C248-2020 in October, uh, where we had uh, directed staff to um, provide us a, uh, an understanding of um, the rezoning of a marina to accommodate a, a transfer site status. Um, and uh, of course, that would be 
uh, a requirement by MECP if any of the marinas in Honey Harbor, for example, were to uh, want to be able to uh, maintain um, uh, bin sites uh, and uh, handle that on a private basis. So um, uh, I guess the wording of, uh, of that resolution needs to uh, be reconsidered now because it was to uh, have staff report back to the Waste Management Committee, which doesn't exist anymore. So presumably that's reporting back to uh, to council as we discuss this. But anyways, that was one resolution um, that is outstanding uh, for action that uh, really prevents um, forward, forward motion or forward discussion on this topic. Um, additionally, uh, we also have uh, resolution Council Resolution C-249-2020, uh, again from October, where uh, Council directed staff to provide clarity, confirmation, and timing on how the township could shift to an allocation of costs for residential solid waste management based on residential property and not based on the current process of mill rate charges. So um, I would uh, I'm not quite sure uh, what action council needs to take uh, to uh, to ask uh, staff to bring this forward, but um, you know th these are are time critical things. We need to understand these things uh, to be able to evaluate options going forward. And um, I don't know, maybe we need a resolution uh, here uh, asking. Uh, uh, well, given that we're committee of the whole, asking council to um, direct staff to bring these reports back ASAP because here we are in March and we passed those in October and we've heard nothing. Ms. Lemieux. Uh, I just wanted to, uh, through you wish, your worship, I can provide a verbal update for council at this time on the zoning issue. Um, and it is anticipated that I can provide an actual report moving forward, likely to the next uh, cow when this is discussed. Uh, to Councillor Hazelton's point regarding the rezoning requirements, uh, both in regards to, for instance, the Miners Bay situation where we're dealing with um, potential public uh, conversion of the lands for the district to hold, as well as private, um, staff are now full steam ahead with meetings with MECP and the district on getting that requirement list finalized and sorted out. Um, so we can move forward with the pre-consultation process with these individual homeowner, uh, sorry, business owners, um, as well as assisting the district full steam ahead on their specific projects um, that, that have to do with them maintaining uh, ownership of lands for those uh, transfer stations to be made. So staff are, it, it's one of our top priorities, Councillor Hazelton right now. Um, we're uh, at the finish line of getting that final document ready um, based on comments from both the district and the MECP. So we're excited to get that all finalized and uh, be able to distribute that information to the public. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Cooper. I guess um, what I'd like to see going forward uh, on this particular subject is a couple of things. One is that um, I think we have some primary uh, primary questions that need to be answered. One of them, which is financial. Uh, we still don't have very good financial information from the district. So another way to get at this and maybe for our next Cal meeting is to find out what it would cost to have the township uh, or not, uh, maybe the, the marinas to outsource the, um, the uh, tipping of bins in, in the various marinas. So I think, I think we need to get to some of these questions. Another one is unmanaged bin sites that we have in the township. Uh, sooner or later, we're not gonna be able to have unmanaged bin sites. And I, I would characterize unmanaged bin sites as ones that are not in marinas, ones where there's just no management. And I just, I very much doubt that MOACP in the future is going to approve uh, sites that are unmanaged. In fact, we've seen sites uh, over the years that have been uh, pretty bad in terms of pollution and 
so forth, because there's no management. So I think one of the big questions is, I think our, our committee needs to go through and take a look at all those, as, that aspect in and of itself. This is the first question I already asked, which is the financial question. Um, and uh, I, I also think that, well, it's interesting that we have a sort of one-off solution at Miners Bay um, I don't think we should be one-offing things. I think we need to sit down and, and really look at uh, the broader picture and then zero in on solutions versus uh, single solutions in only one location. Doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So th those are a few things that I think uh, we need to consider. And on top of which, I, um, well, I, in some ways, I, I certainly support that we brought this back to our council to deal with, and we have to deal with it. But I think um, we do, in particular, as it pertains to what I'll call supervised bin sites at marinas, I think we have to continue to consult with our community and figure out a way to do that so that we haven't uh, uh, sort of taken them out of the picture completely. It doesn't, you know, our, our committee wasn't as effective as it could have been, our previous committee, um, for a variety of reasons. But I, I at the same time, think that involvement with uh, uh, communities, communities that uh, uh, pay a lot of taxes and are very worried about uh, this particular matter, and it's going to be nasty mess if we don't uh, involve them along the way. So I think that's another subject that we could discuss. Uh, I don't have all the answers today, but I'm raising questions that need to be, I think, dealt with. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Rianko. Yeah, I, I don't know if uh, Jessica, <clears throat> had you informed the uh, Waste Committee that it's been disbanded? Uh, that my first, my first question, that they've been told that, okay, so you're checking in, okay, that's good. Uh, <clears throat> I think what we should try to do today is, is set the scope. You, ju you just muted yourself, uh, Councillor Rianco. Oh, okay, last, okay, you heard was, okay. last we heard was set yeah. the scope. Okay, I think what we have to do today is try to set the scope of our study uh, going forward. Um, we have resolutions already passed um, indicating that uh, some of the bin sites um, uh, on the inland community have been, um, will, will, will remain and uh, we'll work with the district uh, to have them properly maintained and, 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 uh, and supervised. Uh, the district is working actively right now on the, on the Minor Bay uh, site, and hopefully by the end of this year, uh, they'll have something uh, going forward that they can have a site at Minor Bay. So we shouldn't be talking about that um, because I think that's already uh, going forward. What I think we should be talking about, there, there is, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but there are 16 marina sites in our township. And I think the nine of them are in Honey Harbor and the rest of them are spread out uh, all, uh, all the way uh, 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 from Port Seven uh, north. So I, I think we should try to concentrate on, 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 the, on the marina bin sites. Now, if you have eight, uh, 16 marinas uh, that have bin sites, I don't think you're going to get MOE permission to have trans uh, transfer sites at all these marinas. Some of them don't have the space. Some of them uh, want to get rid of the, the bins. And I don't think we're going to have um, uh, transfer sites at some of the smaller marinas. I, I, if, if some of the larger marinas want to go ahead and go through the process involved in getting a transfer site at the marinas, fine on them. You know, that's not, they're on their own, I think, on that one. Um, and so the other thing is, is if you want to change the costing formula, I just meant uh, from Councillor Hazleton, you want to change the costing formula for, for handling a waste. Well, you're talking to the wrong people. You got to talk to the district about that. If we're going to continue with the district involvement in handling our waste, uh, I don't think we're going to get a change on the costing formula. Uh, there has been talk uh, about uh, going uh, external on our uh, waste management for our town, uh, our township. Well, keep in mind, we have two companies that provide services in our township. 
One is to the bin sites and another company that does a door to door. So are we talking both those companies, uh, both of those processes that we wanna go external? And again, will the, will the district allow us uh, to opt out of waste management? Uh, part of our, our fee to the district is um, the operations of our, our Rosewood uh, 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 dump and also the, the staffing that we have involved in waste management. I don't think district council is gonna allow us out of that obligation because that would have to be picked up by other townships. And I don't think that's ever gonna happen. So I'm not quite sure when we talk about changing the uh, cost formulas or managing our own waste, um, we can't do that in isolation without talking to the district. So I, I think in our future meetings, I think we have to have say that MOCP uh, at the next meeting, if, if we're going to be talking about uh, putting up uh, uh, waste depots at the marinas, and if we're thinking of, of uh, changing the cost formulas or going external or whatever, we have to have the district involved. Um, uh, so I, I, again, we gotta be able to scope it out. And that's all the comments I have now, but I'll, I'll maybe have some later on. Thank you, Councillor Douglas. Thank you. Um, I've just recently had a conversation with uh, Fred Yon from the district and maybe Jessica can jump in here. Um, Jessica, I think there's some communications being coming up, maybe perhaps between yourself and district on this. Uh, I got an email from Fred yesterday asking to set up a meeting to chat, but that's all I can offer. Okay, thank you. Just, I just wanted that to be known that it is that you guys are already working on it. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe that can come up as a report or something in the next Cal meeting if something fruitful comes out of that, which I'm assuming there will be. Thank you. Councillor Bochuk. This, um... This doesn't affect my ward as nearly as much as other wards. We do have bins at the old Severn Marina here in town for our island residents on Little Lake and Gloucester Pool. And at the marinas up at Six Mile and Gibson. But um, we have a transfer station, which pretty much all the permanent residents use. We get roadside pickup. And uh, if we have anything else, we take it up to the transfer station. My question is, and I have to ask staff this, or perhaps the mayor would know, do we still have the um, Tower Road dump site uh, operational? Yes, we have two transfer stations in our, uh, in our township, uh, South Bay Road and Tower Road. Okay, so I think when, when Council Wianco is talking about the scope of things. I think we need to narrow the scope of things down to what really matters and what doesn't matter um, or what we can do with and what we can do without. And I think we need to establish that first and, and perhaps it's ward by ward um, that we look at the needs of our constituents and, and try and address it that way. I don't I really don't see any um, need for my interaction with this committee because I'm certainly I like to be involved in the decision making, but I don't have much to offer because 90% of my residents get curbside pickup or we just take it up to the transfer station. So um, I'd like to see the focus put towards um, the marinas and somehow certifying the marinas that they can op operate as, um, you know, uh, site bin transfer sites legally. I think that's where the effort needs to be. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Jarvis, do you want to jump in before I do? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I don't have much to add. I'm with Mr. Bocek in some respects here in that, I mean, the island community is my ward and they're very seriously affected by what's being proposed and that is removing bins from the marinas. And, um, <clears throat> We've already discussed this, so I'm, I'm, I'm treading over, retreading ground here. We've got to have some access to waste disposal that's close to the water. It's, I don't think there are any other way of looking at it, uh, unless you want to do island by island pickup. 
Um, uh, the, the options other than that are pretty bloody slim. So um, we've got to figure out through that committee, uh, presumably with our input on how we're going to set those marinas up. I don't see any other option. Um, I, I'm going to jump in for a moment, if I may. Um, I, I think that what we have in front of us is a significant challenge. And I guess I'm looking at it a little bit differently than, than some of you. I mean, I, I think Councillor Bojek uh, is quite correct in that depends on where you are in the township, how much you care and what's in front of you. And what I mean by that is we know that we have, and I forgot what the ratio is, but I'm gonna say a quarter because it might be less, but something like a quarter of our residents have curbside pickup. Um, curbside pickup is the preferred method of the district. They've said that on I don't know how many occasions. Um, and no, no one at this point has proposed that we get rid of curbside pickup in the, in the short run. And interestingly enough, uh, curbside pickup, uh, we have cheaper service than, uh, than you know, we're undercharged by the district for curbside pickup simply because curbside pickup, the, the contract is let at uh, a cost per, um, per driveway, if you will. And the fact that our driveways are a heck of a lot farther apart than the driveways in the towns, we still get charged the same and I forgot what the number was, $25 a year or something. It was some figure like that. Um, so those residents aren't terribly concerned. Um, we have the, a concentration of water access only residents on Go Home Lake, and their solution is probably going to be an expanded transfer station um, where are they all on the road, where they are all, most, a great majority of them are leaving the lake when they are going elsewhere. So it's, the challenge is um, predominantly Georgian Bay water access only cottages. That's the, you know, and I think one of the, the failures of our committee in the past is uh, the fact that we're trying to be all answers to all people, whereas in reality, different people had different concerns. What I think we have failed to do is look at overall concepts and decide which ones are palatable or not. And then, and I think we should try to set that down before we start exploring more details of one alternative versus another. Um, and in my mind, to, to serve our water access only residents, we have a number of options that have been put out in front of us that we might wanna consider. One is water accessible transfer stations. Um, and for instance, our neighbors to the north, the archipelago, that's a significant portion of their solution. They have transfer stations only. And uh, I think four out of seven, I might have my numbers wrong, but uh, I think at least four of their transfer stations are water accessible. One is has no land access, interesting enough, but the other ones have land as well. Um, that's one possible approach. Another approach that we've heard might work is actually putting bins on barges and having a barged bin site transfer station type of thing. Um, and you know, another concept that might possibly work. Um, another alternative is we we're talking about transfer stations at marinas. The last time we met with the MECP, they seem to have extremely low appetite for that alternative because they they'd want them um, staffed and not by staff who happen to be on the property, but staff who, that are at the cage door, if I can put it that way. Um, and we meet all sorts of conditions that were be far too expensive for probably at least half our marinas to even consider. So that I, I, I'm concerned that the marina solution might not be an adequate solution, though it would require more political action, which leads me to the next Thing that I think we have to address, and that is to what degree do we want or, or should require or ask the district to play middleman in this, in, in the sense that the rules and regs that have to be met are set by the province through the MECP, um, and then the district is trying to implement them, 
but we know that they have far more experience on inland lakes and, uh, and road access properties than they do on uh, Georgian Bay. Um, and we, you only have to look at their reports to understand that. Um, and so I, I think we're, we're, we're sort of in, the, in a middle ground right now. And what we have to try to do is decide what we want, what potential solutions are palatable to our residents. And I think we should be, what I suggest we do is ex extend an invitation to the members of our uh, waste committee who were on the bay and see whether they are willing to give us some more input in a more informal structure. In other words, that we don't have to have staff there taking notes and all that stuff. Um, and then also, I think we need an update from district telling us what they have done up to date in regards to uh, uh, solid waste collection in the future for our township and what they plan on doing this year and make sure we get updated to know exactly where we're at there. Um, I think we should also meet with MECP to get an update from them and, conf and confirm with them what we can even consider or not consider. Um, and because, and, 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 and including a discussion with MECP, to what degree should we be working directly with them versus via district? I think that decision we have to make. Um, uh, and then once we, I, I, I'm hoping that those discussions, including absolutely input from our residents, will narrow down our options. And with that narrowing down, then we can start exploring for more information. Um, because I think we have to recognize politically, we're in an awkward position in that our residents are holding us responsible for coming up with a solution for a work that is supposed to be done by the district. And so I think we need more, di more discussion with MECP, more discussion with district, more discussion with our um, residents. And then we got to start moving on this if we decide that we are going to be the solution as opposed to just leaving it in district's hand and providing them with some information. Councillor Cooper. Thank you, Mayor, and you made a very good summary. I think um, uh, a couple of things have been comments about getting rid of curbside. It's, it's $135 a year when you divide it out. <laughs> which is still incredibly low. Uh, so I think there's some solutions that are being provided, services provided to us by the district that are very useful and, and uh, a good value. So I, I think um, one of the things I'd like to do the next time we discuss this, hopefully in Cal next month, is to, is to for argument's sake, pull out our um, budget figures that we have and start walking through the various services and sort of as an agenda item, breaking them down and saying, here's a really good service, we should stick with it um, for now. And, and this is the district's um, a service that's very good for us. But I think we can also be masters of our own destiny. And, and I'd like to uh, find out uh, uh, if we can't, I'd like to understand that because if you look at it, Every municipality, or particularly if you look at Lake of Bays and ourselves, Lake of Bays chooses very different services. They basically have three transfer stations, that's it. No curbside, and I'm not suggesting we're going that direction, but they, is it four? Maybe it's, maybe it's four, but they have four transfer stations. Okay, there's five. One, yeah, I, yeah. Who's gonna give I, I know six? it's more than three. <laughs> who's gonna give me six? Anyway, um, the, the, it's a very, it, their, their costs are half of ours. And, and I'm not suggesting that we're going in that direction. I'm simply saying that's a service that they've chosen to select from the district. And I think we can select certain services just the same. We can have transfer stations like we have at, at, uh, at the tower and, and also down um, in the south end. Um, and we can have curbside. I think we all might agree that if we had two or three tra big transfer stations that are staffed and also curbside, I think we're, we're along the way, but there are some other issues aside from the marinas, which I raised earlier, which is I'd like to discuss again, if we looked at the numbers, and that is these are the unmanned and unsupervised, not at marina bin sites, often of the ones that the district took pictures of and said were a mess. 
And I think we have to look at, at, at those. I, I don't know how many of them there are. There are quite a few of them, as I understand. And uh, some of them can be a problem. So I think, uh, like it or lump it, I think that's another thing that we could do in our next meeting is to walk through all these areas and say that this is something that we need to deal with. And, and the final thing is I, I think we need to, um, uh, at some point, uh, do a little bit of uh, costing as it pertains to, to the marinas uh, and, and what we can do in those marinas to provide the services to a, a, a large population sector then, and barges, I'm sorry to say, uh, is not one that I can convince is gonna work at all, unless you're gonna have barges out there all week. So there you go, thank you. Well, I, I'm just gonna respond quickly to that before I go to Councillor Hazelton. One is, if, if we had barges, I would definitely recommend that barge is available five days a week anchored somewhere I know and that's the, the wear is going to be challenging and then and then on Tuesday it gets hauled but into uh, some spot where it gets the, re the bins get replaced and, and Wednesday gets back out there and then for five days it's available I think with marinas I think what we need to do actually is get an updated conversation I'm going to mention this to staff with MECP and get them to clarify for us beyond with as, as great certainty as they can what would be required for a marina to have a, let me call it garbage collection capability. I mean, I'm, I find myself still very frustrated that what is, a re, what is allowed for a marina that parks boats, like cruisers, South Bay Cove, for instance, to use one example, they can have their own bins, no problem, privately done. Um, right around the corner at Georgian Bay Landing, they got to follow a whole different set of rules because they're serving um, residences, not cruisers. Um, and yet their circumstances otherwise are basically identical. Um, I have a real issue with that, but I think we have to talk to MECP on these matters. Um, I don't want us to go too far down the road of future bin sites at marinas without understanding what has to be done, let me call it legally and, and with regards to provincial regulations. And so I think to me, that should be the next step on uh, marinas. Councillor Hazelton. Thank you, Mayor Kutzpier. Um, I'm gonna start off by saying we're running around in circles here. We have all kinds of information, but we aren't acting on it. Um, and uh, I will uh, go back in time. Uh, April of 2020, I had a lengthy conversation with Chris Hyde at MECP. He outlined for me in detail what was needed for a marina to get a bin site transfer site. And he said that all you have to do, for uh, example, is you go to the unmanned transfer site on the Honey Harbor Road. That is a defined engineered transfer site and you lift and drop that design on any marina site you want. You go to the township, you get the zoning uh, approval to have it a transfer site. Uh, and then the marina operator um, uh, has to commit to providing staff. The bin site can't be open, it has to be locked and it can only be uh, accessed by uh, staff from the marina. So you end up having a, a manned site. So we have known this since last April, but we've made no progress on this on this topic. Um, we there are. I'm not suggesting this is the only idea. I'm not today even suggesting this is the right idea. But I can I can assure you that the conversation has taken place and MECP has provided the guidance and they have given us examples of it. Um, so that's one thing. Um, although uh, although the idea of bins on a barge may be appealing. Um, I have all of the statistics from the companies that pick up on Honey Harbor on how many bin sites they pick up and how frequently they do it. And just with the boat club and the and Nautilus Marina, you would have overloaded a barge for more than two days at a time. Honey Harbor, or sorry, Nautilus Marina has uh, five bins plus uh, two recycling garbage, plus, sorry, two recycling cardboard plus two recycling plastic. Um, Boat Club has a similar thing, and they have pickups two or three times a week. You, you're not going to get a barge big enough to do that. So the barge thing, I think, is is a, is a fail thing. But I don't want to rule it out. I think what we need to do here is 
We need to have multiple strategies simultaneously being raced at because we are, we, if we don't, we're going to run out of time. Here we are almost a year later from when I discovered that a bin site at a marina was a viable option from MECP's perspective. Um, all I needed to learn after that was, can we bill at a individual property level for garbage? I didn't get that resolution on the table, sorry, until October, but we don't have an answer on that. Uh, we don't have an answer on what the zoning is, I issue is. And again, I apologize, I didn't bring that resolution forward until October, but we don't have an answer on that. So there are things that we need to know. The other, other th key thing, and, and Councillor Cooper uh, touched on this, there are lots of different garbage strategies. And in order to get at the fundamental building blocks of what the costs are uh, township for garbage, we've asked these questions a million, a million times, but we get nothing, it's crickets from the district. They just don't, don't give us the data we need. But let me, let me offer a little idea here. Uh, and I've probably said this before and I apologize for repeating myself, but if we took the township and said, number one district, you give us the cost for keeping our South Bay Road and Tower Road transfer sites. You give us what that's gonna cost. That is gonna to apply to every resident in the township. Now, all of those people on roads, they're gonna opt in for roadside service, bingo. So you know what you're, you're gonna charge them because it's gonna be the, the, blend, the, the, the allocated costs per property of the two tower uh, and South Bay road sites. And then you up that number uh, to include uh, what the roadside service is. Now, that now gives us a model from which we can say to the marinas, okay, you know, Mr. Marina operator, what your uh, cottage uh, customer is going to have to pay for waste management because of these two transfer sites. Now, I... I'm going to operate a marina transfer site and I'm going to charge you X dollars per year for handling your garbage for you in this transfer site. Now, it's easy to come up with the cost of what that's going to cost the, the marina operator because we already have all of the pickup costs and we have all the pickup data. So we have all the, everything we need except what is the township going to, what is the township process to get to a transfer site? And we already have sample engineering designs for what it would take to have that transfer site on the marina property. So now the marina operator is could be in a position, if we can just get this data from district, the marina operator is in a position of, can I make this a money-making money, money making venture for me as a marina operator? And therefore, I, as a marina operator, am incented to offer this as a service. So I'm not saying this is the only path but this has been crystal clear in my head since last April, and I'm very frustrated that we can't move forward on it. And one of the biggest problems is really what Councillor Cooper said, is we can't get the data from the district to give us this foundational allocation per property basis, because we already have an allocation for, for roadside pickup. We know what that is. That's a simple thing for us to, to, to do. Well, why can't we get this uh, cost per two transfer sites that will be universal for every property in the township and use that as a foundation. Anyways, I, I'll, I'll stop talking. You can tell I'm very frustrated. This model is very clear in my mind. I'm not, I, I, I don't know if it will work, but we can't even get the data that we need to figure it out. And I've already had conversations with a few of the marinas in Honey Harbor and they are totally on board with the idea, but they're saying the same thing show me the numbers. Can't get the numbers. I, I recognize your frustration, but without provincial permission to do what you want to do, we can talk and get all the numbers we want. But I think the biggest challenge, and you may say that you individually talk to Chris Hyde instead of working through council and staff, but it doesn't mean that what we've heard from him since is consistent with that. Well, and that's a bit of a concern. Well, if, if I've already got the answer from Chris Hyde and other people are meeting with Chris Hyde, then maybe what we should be doing is trying to team up so that we can ensure that what I got from Chris 
is what our staff could get from Chris as well. Which Maybe is why a standard not... procedure is that we ask staff to do this research so that all of council can get it and assess it. I understand that. I understand that. Let me let me point out one one key thing. There is a code of conduct uh, report produced, uh, integrity commissioner report produced for a township north of us, where there was a planner who was uh, bringing his planning expertise to council and unfortunately interrupting uh, the work of of staff in that environment. And so the integrity commissioner suggested you shouldn't be doing that. However, the integrity commissioner went on to say that where there are councillors who have expertise that can complement staff, staff should be trying to welcome them and the councillor should be welcoming the opportunity to work with staff so that we can work as a team as opposed to us and them. Councillor Rianco. Thank you very much. Uh, just to answer one of your questions, uh, Mr. Mayor, um, I think a couple of months ago, the district did put out their work plan for 2021 on waste management. And that went to the, uh, the committee and also the council. So you can, uh, you can uh, look that up to find out what the plans are for uh, 2021. And one of them is to, to uh, work on the Miners Bay uh, 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 Waste Depot. I may shock a few uh, councils by saying this, but to me, waste is not a cost issue to me. It's more of a convenience to our, um, our communities. If it comes down to having a bin site down the road or paying less to go to a transfer site, they'll want that bin site down the road. They don't mind paying a little extra to have the convenience. So bundling this whole discussion up into costs uh, does not really sit well with me and probably the community. It's obvious that the marinas want to have bin access from their docks. If you have nine waste depot sites in, in Honey Harbor, that's a lot more expensive than having one bin site or say a waste depot in Honey Harbor. And in my opinion, even if we talk to the ministry and the ministry says, yes, here's a process for marinas to go ahead and have a, a waste depot site constructed at this site, not all nine marinas in Honey Harbor are gonna want that or, or be able to have the space or the cost. So I think at some little pace along the way, we have to bite the bullet and ask uh, the district to look for another uh, uh, waste depot site in the Honey Harbor area and there are some locations down there. Keep in mind that over half the people in this township put the garbage in the back of the car and go to either a transfer site or a waste depot. So I don't feel too sorry for those people who have to come into the marinas, put the garbage in the, in the, in the, in the back of the car and drive two or three kilometers to uh, a waste depot. It might have to come down to that. But the idea of every marina having water access bin sites, I don't think is going to work for all 16 sites and keep in mind 16 sites, not just nine, it's not just Honey Harbor, there are other uh, 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 bin sites around. So if, for example, if we had a, a common uh, uh, waste depot site in Honey Harbor, then we would have five major sites similar to uh, Lake of Bays. Uh, there'd be two transfer sites and three waste depot sites. And then on top of that, of course, we would have the door-to-door, -door, which is more convenient. Door-to-door uh, -door is only good for certain uh, cottage roads. There's a lot of road, cottage roads in our township that uh, the, the trucks uh, cannot get down because of, of the narrowness or the condition of those roads. So again, people have to put the garbage into cars and take them to the transfer site. So I'll just put that out there and Again, this idea of the, the marinas looking into making um, a business a waste depot. Well, everybody in the township 
needs to pay the base costs for waste management in our district, which is maintaining of, of the, of the uh, Rosewood uh, uh, dump and the staff that we have. I don't think they can opt out of that. And of course, if, if, the, if the marinas go to a, a, a private uh, bin site, then where do they take the garbage? I don't think that the district's going to want them up at the, up, up at Bracebridge and where are they going to go? So there's a lot of complication systems here. We start opting out of the district services that are available to us. So there's a lot of things that have to be uh, considered here, but I think in the short term, we should be making a decision that we will need uh, a waste depot in, in the Honey Harbor area to serve some, if not all the marinas at some point. And the sooner we make that, the sooner the district can start looking at it and get it in operation. All right, thank you. Councillor Cooper. Um, I think Brian said this a little bit earlier and I, and I, and I um, kind of agree with him and that is we all should stay in our own lane. So what I mean by that is, I'm gonna suggest that we do a bit of a breakout on this particular subject uh, in advance of our next uh, meeting and uh, we get our coastal community councillors together to look at a solution and look at a variety of different things. And, and our other councillors can look at some solutions for the uh, inland areas and the ham, hamlets and towns. But I, I can guarantee you that, uh, for example, that uh, our communities are not going to be happy with one roadside transfer station somewhere in Honey Harbor. That's not going to fly either. So I think we need to examine some of these things. And uh, I think our, our decision making is a bit cumbersome because uh, um, we're coming at it from different angles. So my suggestion would be what I've just made, which is we do a bit of a breakout and meet at the next Cal meeting with some, with some uh, suggestions and recommendations. Thank you. Sounds reasonable to me. Um, any other thoughts at this time? Okay. Well, I think it's a good discussion. And I think what we have to do is try to strive towards um, action plans going forward. Um, I believe uh, as Councillor Hazelton uh, reminded us, there was a couple of outstanding requests and maybe some, some response to those. I know uh, Ms. Lemieux said that she's working on it. So we might have some more information next month, which I think would be a, a good thing. Is there any new business? for the Committee of the Whole. Then I have moved by Councillor Cooper, seconded by Councillor Bocek. Be it resolved that the Committee of the Whole does now adjourn at 2.36 p.m. to reconvene on Tuesday, April 13th, 2021 at 1 p.m. All those in favor? All right, and that is carried. 